Another thing that's worth really mentioning or focusing on before we talk too much about the, the idea of development uh, in intelligence is, is that nowadays when we're talking about intelligence, many people believe that, that we can't just talk about a person's intelligence based on their IQ score. Many researchers believe that intelligence is extremely multifaceted. There are some researchers uh, that, that believe that all intelligence can kind of be, be brought down to just one particular factor, but there's some researchers out there that think that there's many different things that we need to measure in intelligence if we're going to talk about growth and in intelligence throughout the lifespan. Well, the first researchers to really push this was a man named Robert Sternberg who, who came up with this idea of what he called this triarchic theory of intelligence. And he's actually used a number of three intelligence type combinations over the years. Uh, one of his more current ones is listed there in this slide, the analytical, creative, and practical abilities of intelligence. But, but in the base form of Sternberg's theory, he argues that we can't whittle intelligence down to one thing. We have to talk about three different ways that a person's intelligent. And there's another researcher named Howard Gardner who actually has argued that Sternberg isn't coming even close to how many different types of intelligence that are out there. He's got this theory of multiple intelligences that actually has, I believe at the time, he's added a couple along the way, nine different types of intelligences that are out there. And you see those nine different types of intelligence listed there. But some people have even argued that Gardner doesn't hit on all the different types of intelligences that are important. There's two prominent researchers in the field of social psychology, we're going to talk about them a little bit later, named Salvoy and Mayer, who believe there's a type of intelligence called EEQ, or emotional intelligence, that they think is just as important as somebody's academic intelligence. They see the ability to communicate effectively, to understand your own emotions, to, to kind of regulate yourself in appropriate ways in different situations, is being just as important as having a huge amount of information. And another separation that people have started to create for intelligence is talking, especially when we look at development, about two different ways that intelligence work. We talk about what's called fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. The idea of fluid intelligence is this notion that you know, your brain is kind of ready to learn, ready to, to kind of process information that can adapt on the fly. And the idea is that if you're more capable of learning, then you have higher fluid intelligence. And many research studies show that, that we get to about our peak of fluid intelligence around the age of 20. That our brains are super capable of picking up on things, making connections, and kind of processing information at a ridiculously high level. But Another type of intelligence that we think is important is what's actually in your brain, what, what's been learned over the years and how you use that stuff successfully. And that relates to another type of intelligence that we call crystallized intelligence. And there's a belief that this particular type of intelligence is something that we're always growing in understanding throughout the years. And we've actually linked this idea of intelligence to something that we called wisdom. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the idea here, again, is that you know when we're looking at intelligence, it's a very multifaceted thing that sometimes intelligence can't, tests can't hit. So there's again a lot of trepidation or concern that people have when they start talking about how we can link this idea of development to this broad overarching concept of intelligence. All right, now that we've kind of discussed some of the concerns that we have, now that can kind of lead us into what we're going to be talking about in the second part of this class, and that's you know how we can tie the concept of intelligence into development. And as we see here, you know it's going to be a very difficult task because there's lots of aspects to intelligence that we can look at. There's lots of types of tests for intelligence that are out there, and there's lots of concerns when we talk about what intelligence is, how we measure it when we start tying this concept into things like heritability or kind of the changes that we see throughout the lifespan. So now when we get into the second part of the class, you're going to hear a lot of tentative information, a lot of concerns, or actually watch a video that really debates this idea of whether or not we can even link intelligence to cultures and development. But you know, the process, now that you have this kind of base information, you, you can kind of keep these things swirling in your mind when we get to this concept of intelligence and development.
when we look at uh, this concept of heritability and uh, this idea of intelligence testing, one of the main questions that usually arises is this question of you know, where extreme cases of intelligence come from. And when we look at extremes of intelligence, obviously we can have people fall on one of two ends of the spectrum. They can be either very high in intelligence or they can be very low in intelligence. And in cases where people are very high in intelligence, we usually define this as giftedness, or we define people who have IQs, if we go back to the, the Spearman, or sorry, the Stanford Binet tests, as people having an IQ of over 130 being gifted. Well, when we look at gifted individuals and kind of use that definition of intelligence, we make a lot of assumptions. Right? We make the assumption that these people probably are intelligence based on the test, and therefore they're probably capable of adapting to a lot of situations. And after making those assumptions, be they true or false, researchers start to look at a lot of different types of aspects to these people and some of the, the effects that they have on their environment. And what we often see with gifted people in research are a number of interesting things. One of the things uh, when we see gifted people is that uh, typically when we measure a gifted individual, they typically, I said typically twice, I apologize, but they usually only excel in one or two very specific areas. So even though we might think of Bill Gates as an extremely intelligent individual, uh, he probably only is very intelligent in a very specific way. So he knows computers, he knows that particular area. Social skills, other types of skills might not be nearly as good, and usually aren't nearly as good as their, their specific area of excellence. And this really does uh, scream out uh, that triarctic theory or you know, Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence, this notion that you know, we might have different areas that we're good in. But despite the belief, though, that these people might only be good in one thing, that doesn't mean that they're bad in everything else. In fact, very, very rarely is somebody very good at something and then absolutely horrible or incapable of doing other things. Uh, and this uh, works for most individuals high in intelligence, but there's one slight exception to that, and that's in cases of people uh, that are called savants. And these are people that have exceptional ability in one specific area and really struggle in every other aspect of their life. Now, if any of you have ever seen the movie Rain Man, uh, which is a movie that's depicted in the upper right-hand corner with Dustin Hoffman, uh, this is a great example of somebody that's considered a savant or suffering from savant syndrome, where they have very few social skills, and very uh, big personality deficits, but they're very good at one specific area. And usually with savants, we see people very good at math, but very poor in other areas. Uh, even though this is very popular in movies, and a lot of people kind of have this misnomer about people with autism all being savants, uh, very rarely does this type of person emerge. In fact, 99 times out of 100, when we look at very gifted individuals like Dustin Hoffman in that movie, uh, we see people who are not only good at what they're doing, but more than capable of doing everything else. So they might not be unbelievably gifted, so they might not be significantly more intelligent than our people around them in every category of their life, but usually they do fairly well, and maybe even excel a little bit in other areas of their life, even though they have one specific area where they tend to shine. And when we look for where this is coming from, where this either improved performance across all areas or a really big improvement in one specific area is coming from, what we often see is that it's linked to both the environment and genetics. So your parents are contributing some of it. Your parents probably display very high levels of intelligence. But if we tease that out, we still see uh, kind of a number of other things impacting your intelligence in particular your experience, your exposure to things, usually pushes you to excel in a specific area. When we look at the other extreme, uh, kind of the lower levels of intelligence, we're looking at something called mental retardation. Now, I know this is a particular term uh, that has gained a lot of awareness over the years, in particular because of the derogatory nature of this particular term, but in terms, uh, in psychology, 
uh, in this area. Uh, mental retardation is not meant as something interrogatory. It's merely used as a way of defining people that have a limited mental ability. In fact, anybody below an IQ of 70 is defined as being mentally retarded. And that means that their brain patterns, their, their speed of development, their capability of development is stunted in comparison to other individuals. Because remember, we're predicting a very steady pattern of growth in cognitive abilities. And retarded merely means a slowing down of that particular growth. Now, Usually, when we look for identifying people that are mentally retarded, we have to find them, or we usually test them, before the age of 18. That's when these symptoms typically emerge, where their intelligence is significantly lower. Anybody detected after the age of 18, or anybody who has a huge decline in mental abilities after the age of 18, typically are experiencing something from their environment. So there's some physical cause, some major trauma to the brain that's suddenly changing their performance with respect to their peers. So when we talk about mental retardation, somewhere at a very young age, a child gets off track. So they stop having the ability to process things. They don't learn nearly as quickly. So their, their performance is getting worse and worse in comparison to their peers as they progress into the adolescent years. When we look closer at this particular definition, though, we can see that mental retardation actually can be broken down into four different IQs. And the four different IQs levels that we have, or the four different mental retardation levels that we have, are called mild, moderate, severe, and profound. Mild mental retardation is by far the most common type of mental retardation. And it defines individuals who IQ range, whose IQ range is somewhere between 55 to 70 on the Stanford Binet test. That score means that these people typically are capable of handling themselves, they can take care of themselves, but uh, they struggle with some of the day-to-day -day functioning uh, to where they need a little bit of help. Anybody below mild re mental retardation usually has uh, some profound effects on their life. So moderate uh, individuals typically need a lot of help with the daily activities. Severe individuals and profound individuals when their IQs are extremely low usually need constant attention, constant help in order to be able to function on a regular basis. Fortunately, uh, for individuals with this particular problem, uh, severe and profound levels of mental retardation are very rare. They're usually uh, paired up with some major developmental and physical problem that causes this dramatic difference in intelligence performance compared to other individuals. And when we're talking about mental retardation, what we're looking at is people that in reality, not only have a low IQ, but really struggle to adapt to everyday life. In fact, uh, this inability to adapt to everyday life is what typically uh, kind of entices uh, parents or educational areas to test the intelligence of these children and see if maybe they could be diagnosed as having mental retardation. And if they're having difficulty adapting to things and their IQ is below 70, usually that qualifies them as being defined as mentally retarded. When we look closer at mental retardation, in particular those extremes, and look for the causes of it, what we often see is people who have IQs below the age, or below, not the age, but below uh, 50, uh, usually have some major genetic deficits uh, that uh, are linked to it. So Down syndrome is a classic one that's often linked to it, but there's some other deficits, some other genetic problems that we discussed in the first class that can also be, well actually the second class, that can also be linked to uh, these extremely low cases of uh, IQ. When we go above 50, you know, the 50 to 70 range, uh, we actually can see uh, that usually uh, there's kind of a cultural or an uh, experience uh, based influence and possibly a genetic based influence on these levels of, of intelligence. But a lot of researchers have grown to believe that anybody who's in that 60 to 70 range uh, 
might have been able to function at a normal level if they were given the right environment, if they were exposed to the right amount of things. And that gives us a lot of hope that for these people that are in that 60 to 70 range, or even in the 70s, uh, we, if we give them the right uh, environment, if we give them the right amount of help, a lot of their, uh, I guess, deficits uh, could be alleviated. We can help them uh, speed up their learning process, help them kind of integrate some new cognitive behaviors, and actually become much more adept at taking care of themselves. And uh, that type of treatment uh, relates to this fact that when we look at people who are defined as being mentally retarded, a lot of them experience certain types of support. And support can come in a number of different ways. It can go to a point where it's just intermittent, where there's very, very few exposures to training and people that are around them, uh, to pervasive, where there's constant need to attend to people. And within that range, uh, we usually treat people uh, based on their IQ levels and their functionality, their ability to actually deal with what's going on in their environment. And for those high IQ people, the ones that are in the 60s, 70s, uh, there's always some hope that a lot of social skills, a lot of physical skills and cognitive abilities can be improved to the point where a person is more than capable of maintaining uh, some level of performance and some self-sufficiency as they age. Uh, both these ideas, though, of extremes, both high and low, lead us to this notion of the concept of heritability. And this relates to the proportion of our behaviors, of our intelligence in this case, that can be attributed to either nature, so the genes that we have, uh, the parents that we have, and nurture how much our environment actually is impacting us, so the limited or very in-depth exposure that we have to specific stimuli. And what we see in a number of studies, in particular studies with identical twins that are either raised together or raised apart, and identical twin pairs and fraternal twin pairs where we can compare scores, uh, what we often see in these studies is that neither nature nor nurture explain the entire relationship between intelligence and heritability. In fact, most of the time what we see is that both nature and nurture play a very prominent role in intelligence, in particular when we look at adult intelligence. So even though some kids might be very exceptional because of their nurturing, because they really get a very uh, I guess dedicated upbringing, as they reach adulthood, a lot of their behaviors are going to kind of revert or kind of transition into uh, more of a mix of not only a nurture environment but also uh, a nature environment. So if your parents aren't are extremely smart and you're exposed to all this stuff, you might excel for a short while, but then you kind of get back to a level that's fairly close to your parents. If your parents aren't very, are very intelligent, sorry, and if for some reason you're exposed to an environment that's not very nurturing, uh, usually as we get into adulthood, there's continual growth that eventually gets that person up to a level that's at least higher uh, than we would expect with just looking at the nurturing uh, environments or the, the people around them. And these tests, especially longitudinal ones that look at uh, adult behavior, really speak to the need to both uh, have fairly good genes and, in particular, have no genetic defects uh, when trying to have a high IQ or having children that have a high IQ, but also it speaks to this need to nurture, right? to, to create an environment that challenges and encourages cognitive growth. Some other things that we see with uh, heritability, things that really speak to how powerful the, the nurturing environment can actually be, uh, are some specific studies that have shown what can happen if, uh, I guess, the right specific environment isn't met for a number of individuals. So even though in very intelligent people, usually have to experience the right things. Uh, the big problem that we see, the big major issue that we have, is in those situations uh, where people are very low on intelligence. And if there's no genetic deficit, usually we've identified a couple very specific things with this. One of the big things uh, that usually is tagged along uh, 
with uh, lower levels of intelligence is when a child goes through something called a schooling lapse, where they are not in school for an exceptionally long period of time during childhood. Now, we're not talking about kids that are homeschooled by very intelligent parents who are following a very regimented program. We're talking about kids who will go years without any exposure to education or schooling whatsoever. And these school lapses have a huge impact on intelligence performance in multiple areas of intelligence. Another thing that we see in a number of studies is that when a child is exposed to parents who are in a very low uh, IQ level, and when they're in a very low SES or socioeconomic status uh, group, and when they're in a community that uh, kind of encourages low intelligence or doesn't value intelligence, those children, even if they display very high levels of intelligence at a young age, typically develop into adults with very low levels of intelligence. And uh, this kind of gradual change has led a lot of intelligence researchers and educational researchers to push for detecting these children, push for the ones that have the potential, the genetic ability to do well, uh, but are challenged or pushed back by these conditions and find a way to encourage these kids to, to kind of fulfill their potential. And uh, there's been a lot of mixed results with this particular attempt because a lot of that home environment really pushes these children down as they're growing, as they're trying to learn things. One final thing, which is really interesting when we look at this idea of heritability, is uh, something that we call the Flynn effect. And the Flynn effect deals with this uh, finding that we've discovered over the years that as we progress, each generation to the next, our intelligence performance, if we take the same tests, typically tends to improve. So if we compare somebody from 1932 to 1997 with the exact same test. On average, those individuals taking that same test from 1932 and 1997 will score about 120. Now, we balance that out for the 1997 people, so no, but not everybody scores 120, they all score 100, but if we're testing the same thing, there's a dramatic growth in intelligence, and that's really interesting for a number of reasons. One of them is because if we're looking for what's superior in intelligence and using old tests, we might detect a huge portion of the population as being, uh, I guess, gifted. Uh, so we have to kind of adjust our intelligence tests with each generation to kind of take into account the growth in cognitive skills that seems to be developing within each generation. What this also means for you guys, if you're thinking about the Flynn effects, is the next time you hear your grandparents or your parents complaining about how uninformed and how low in intelligence everybody is at this age, you can tell them that in reality, you know, on average, your particular generation is smarter than any other generation, or they at least score higher on intelligence tests than any other generation before them, and that trend continues. So unfortunately, when you become grandparents and you start complaining about this genera their generation, they're probably going to be able to say the same thing to you. One other thing, though, that we see with this concept of heritability, before we really say that intelligence is entirely genetic based is that when we compare different cultures, one of the major problems that we've run into over the generations is that a lot of groups have used low intelligence testing performance to indicate that a specific culture or a specific group of individuals is not very intelligent. Uh, one classic example of this is actually Lewis Terman, the man who redevised the Stanford Binet test and his attempt, early attempts to use this test as a way of showing that essentially specific races and specific individuals are genetically inclined to be low in intelligence. And he actually used this, sadly, uh, to promote a theory that he called eugenics, the, the systematic kind of removal of specific races and of specific groups from our population. He, uh, he was proposing it through breeding purposes, but uh, not actually killing people, but that doesn't mean it's that much better in theory. And this idea of comparing cultures, 
particular this idea that intelligence is an entirely heritable thing and we can just use a basic test like the Spearman has led a lot of intelligence researchers uh, that are in very extreme camps to propose that intelligence is entirely due to genetics and uh, environment and we can completely uh, I guess remove specific groups because they'll never be intelligent but what we've seen in a number of studies is that if we test intelligence in different ways a lot of times uh, one group might, one group of individuals might display very low intelligence in one category, but very high intelligence in another. And what I'd like you to do is actually watch a video that shows an example of some experiments that have done with, been done with one group of individuals that were originally considered to be very low in intelligence. That might very well indeed uh, prove that their intelligence far exceeds the intelligence of other individuals in one specific area. So please, take a minute out watch this video and then after that we'll move on to the very end of this class. So when we look at uh, this idea of heritability, when we look at the idea of extremes, we've already mentioned a couple problems with intelligence testing. Uh, that uh, you know, we don't know whether or not intelligence fits a specific pattern. We don't know if everybody's intelligence develops in the exact same well. Well, in addition to those problems of intelligence development, uh, a couple other major problems have arisen over the years when we talk about intelligence tests. One of the big problems that we run into, first of all, is the fact that when we look at infant behavior, even though an a child might display very high levels of intelligence in one test, if they take that exact same test a month or two months later, those infants very often can score very low on that exact same test. In essence, there's a huge amount of fluctuation in intelligence levels of children, and we're not sure if this is just based on the randomness of their behavior in the tests, or whether or not we're all kind of having periods of exceptional growth and then very slow growth as we age, but we know that there's those giant fluctuations, regardless of where it's coming from, in childhood intelligence. But once we get past childhood, once we get past infancy and childhood, our intelligence starts to become more stable. And uh, even though we might have slight changes uh, with individuals, uh, usually once we reach adolescence, our intelligence at uh, adolescence usually is pretty predictive of our intelligence uh, throughout the rest of our life, so in adulthood and late adulthood. Some cases are different, so you might have a person that really blossoms because of uh, some experience or some exposure to something that causes them to really push their cognitive abilities. And other individuals obviously might have a huge uh, drop in their intelligence if they're not challenged by anything or if they experience some physical problem. But for the most part, when we look at intelligence, even though we might, you know, kind of be somewhat stable in our growth, or it might be a somewhat predictable pattern, uh, there's a lot of fluctuation in our young years, and then we get very set in our older years. So we know that intelligence is something that we might be able to measure. We know there's just variation in it, but we don't know kind of where this varying, meandering path of intelligence is coming from. But we do know that once it's there, it's fairly set for the rest of our lives. And that set idea of intelligence, this idea of it kind of growing, 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 and then being relatively set, deals with one major type of intelligence that we look at, and that's something called fluid intelligence, the ability to kind of adjust and learn things. And when we're measuring fluid intelligence, when we're comparing it across individuals, uh, what we see is that once we reach early adulthood, and we talked about this earlier at about age 20, our fluid intelligence skills start to decline a little bit. But that fluid intelligence skills uh, and the decline is very, very minimal. In fact, if we look at specific types of fluid intelligence, we see almost a perfect leveling off after we reach the age of about 30, where we drop very little. The only types of fluid intelligence that seem to really, really drop is how quickly we're able to recognize things and uh, our number skills. And that might entirely be a product just of the fact that we're not usually exposed to many numbers as we age. But even though our fluid intelligence does drop off, 
uh, what we also see is that people's crystallized intelligence tends to go up. So our fluid intelligence levels are relatively set from person to person, and they only decline a little bit as we age. But our crystallized intelligence, the information that we have that we can use, is always growing. And that growth in crystallized intelligence allows us to make slightly better decisions and more informed decisions as we grow. And that is what represents higher levels of intelligence. So in one respect, intelligence does drop a little bit, just like we would see in other things. But in another respect, cognitive performance, uh, in particular crystallized intelligence and cognitive performance, tends to increase as we age. However, when we think back to another thing, we can even look at this a little bit closer with that slight decline that we talked about in fluid, uh, in fluid intelligence and get another perspective of whether or not fluid intelligence drops at all. Now, for those of you that remember the Flynn effect, when we talked about the fact that different generations typically do a little bit worse than their predecessors, or actually new generations do a little bit better, sorry, than their predecessors at different intelligence tests. Well, that means when we look at intelligence, that when we compare people across cultures and use it to predict intelligence, we might expect, and you see this in the cross-sectional approach line, a dramatic drop in intelligence. But when we use the longitudinal approach, when we follow one group for a very long period of time, we see almost no changes in people's intelligence. In particular, their fluid intelligence as they age. And this gives us <laughs> some very uh, kind of exciting news, or enticing news, to think that maybe this is one area of cognitive performance that really doesn't get affected by the environment. And a number of studies have really shown that intelligence is one particular area where we don't see that decline that we usually see with other areas of psychology. In fact, if we look even closer at this concept of crystallized intelligence and that growth in crystallized intelligence, a lot of researchers believe that we not only don't decline, but in theory, we become more intelligent as we age. In fact, we gain something that a lot of people call wisdom, or expert knowledge about aspects of life that allow us to make much better decisions in situations that we encounter. Well, we do know more as adults, but before we start thinking that every old person is full of wisdom and there's nothing wrong with them, we need to appreciate the fact that in a number of different studies that have looked at the wisdom, or the, the correct choices, the judgments that make the most sense, as people age, when we compare different groups, they don't seem to be displaying that much more wisdom. Essentially what that means is in tests, old people in their 60s and 70s don't make any better decisions than people in their 20s or 30s. They might know a lot more, they might understand a lot more, but they don't display this concept of wisdom that we would anticipate. In fact, usually when we look at most people, wisdom never really happens. We all make a bunch of really silly random decisions that uh, if we look at calculations for things like investments or decisions in life or all these different options, uh, usually aren't that wise. And that's not something that just magically appears when we get older because our crystallized intelligence is actually rising. In fact, for the limited number of people that do display wisdom, usually we see indications of wisdom by the time they get into early adulthood or even by the time they get into late adolescence. And even though they might not have enough knowledge to make very wise decisions all the time, flickers of wisdom seem to emerge in this particular stage. And we usually tie wisdom not to intelligence, not to the number of things that a person's experienced, but specific personality factors. In particular, uh, the ability to be open to different options, consider multiple ways, and be creative with different ways to come up with solutions seem to be the best predictors of wisdom, not growth in crystallized intelligence. So, even though there's this increase in crystallized intelligence, and you could say that we're technically becoming smarter as we age, <laughs> recognize that uh, in our wisdom, our correct decisions, our ability to use that knowledge very effectively, doesn't seem to increase as much as we would hope with age. <laughs>
So when we look at intelligence, just to kind of wrap it up, when we're looking at development, we're kind of using that to predict intelligence, what we're doing is saying that cognitive performance should unfold in a very specific pattern. And based on that unfolding pattern, we can actually use that chart or that way that we think people are going to change to compare them uh, in levels of what we call intelligence. Now, our studies looking at intelligence have shown that there's different aspects of intelligence that we probably need to consider. Uh, and that uh, this intelligence thing probably grows with years, but we should be fairly consistent across the years that we develop. Uh, and when we try to measure intelligence, this is one particular area where even though we might lose speed in processing with some things, intelligence seems to be kind of a continually rising level of performance over time if we take into, certain, into account certain aspects like the Flynn effect. This marks the end of this class. In the next class, we're going to be moving on to the concept of language development. Please, if you can, make sure to have read chapter 9 read by that next class. And if you do have any questions about either this week's section, or I guess this section, or next section, uh, make sure that you let me know. Send me an email. I haven't heard from a lot of you, but that's all right. And remember to keep up with all the work and all the readings like most of you have been doing. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing all of you soon.